All right, let's go and get started. Um, let me get the uh, like suggested and whatnot. All right, okay. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so first things first, let me get the sign-in sheet passed around. So I'll give that to you. If you could get a date on that for me, that'd be great. Um, okay, so a few quick announcements. So homework four uh, is due on Tuesday. It's not due today. Um, there's only one thing that we haven't covered yet, uh, and that's the use of solver and goal seek, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so we'll, we'll, once we discuss that today, I think you'll be all squared away to finish everything with the homework. But in all honesty, the amount of work required uh, on the homework to use Goal Seek and Solver takes about four seconds. It's really very short. So it's more about once you understand how to use Solver, you'll go, oh, okay, this is, this is really easy. The work really uh, is to actually complete the second in-class exercise if you haven't already done so. Um, so go, speaking of homework four, um, I still have a few hard copies of the assignment. I know that I posted online, uh, so some of you might not need it. But um, I do have hard copies. Does anybody want one that doesn't already have a hard copy of the assignment? If I have some, that means some of you all don't, because I print one for each student. So if I've got extras, it means somebody didn't get theirs. Um, is everybody good? OK, all right. Uh, that's fine. Now, just so everybody remembers, um, we have our first celebration on next Thursday. So everybody's clear on um, uh, the procedure. So. On Tuesday, we're not really going to have lecture per se. It's not going to be a class where we cover anything. Uh, I'm going to come in. Uh, your homework and whatnot will be turned in. And then I'll have a few minutes at the beginning where I'll sort of outline, OK, here's what the exam's going to look like. Here's the format. Here's the topics that are going to be on it, which I think everybody uh, should be fairly aware of what it, what's going to be on it. But all in all, it's going to be all the fundamental stuff we did at the beginning, uh, all the Casio stuff and at least uh, a good chunk of the Excel stuff that we've done uh, up until now. And that'll be, uh, that'll be exam one. So um, <coughs> once I get done, I'll sort of shut up and let you all ask literally whatever you want. So it's really uh, all uh, on you to come prepared to ask uh, whatever. So uh, that, that's really going to be the deal uh, on Tuesday. Um, I thought I would also mention Engineering Career Day. Um, it's an event that... Uh, we host every year uh, on campus for the surrounding high schools. It's basically for folks in 10th uh, in grade. They come to campus and they do uh, activities. They learn about engineering and maybe they're interested in coming to Marshall. Um, I know that there have been students that have, a, have decided to attend Marshall because they went to Engineering Career Day. Well, on the flip side, for you all, there's potential employers that are going to be there. Maybe you can rub elbows, do some networking, uh, things like that. So uh, if you're interested... Uh, it starts, uh, well, I think the event actually starts around uh, anywhere between 8 and 9. There's going to be buses coming in and students sort of filtering in and out. But the event's sort of all morning. It's, uh, it starts at around 8 or 9, and it goes till about, I want to say, 12 or 1 or something. And there's a, a, in the Don Morris room, there'll be an exhibit hall. There'll be um, uh, booths set up from different companies and whatnot. There'll be a lot of Army Corps folks there uh, and what have you. So if you're interested, it uh, might be worth checking out. All right, sound good? Okay, all right. So uh, uh, we're going to be talking today about Goal Seek uh, and Solver, and I want to sort of set the stage for why this is important. And I think the best place to start um, is with what we did last time. So uh, last time, uh, going into the notes, last time we looked at um, uh, developing this whole uh, projectile motion spreadsheet. And the idea, one of the, the, the nice things about uh, Excel is with very little input, we were able to generate quite a bit. I mean, let, let's be clear. The only input on that spreadsheet, the only real input, was the acceleration due to gravity, which I would argue is not an input because it's a constant unless we're on Jupiter. You know? Anywhere on Earth, uh, gravity is going to be negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Uh, beyond that, the only input was, remember, we're talking about projectile motion, so we're talking about taking an object and launching it through the air. The only input was where is the object, its initial x and y, its velocity, how, far, how fast I chuck it, and the angle at which I chuck it. That was it. That's the only input at all. And based on that input, we were able to do quite a bit. I mean, we were able to compute all the necessary parameters. We were able to track that particle as it moved through the air and even plot it, you know. And the nice thing about the spreadsheet is if I start changing parameters, 
everything else changes in response. Okay, so let me sort of make sure that's clear. Okay, <coughs> so uh, here's the spreadsheet, which here's a little Excel um, trick for you in case you're interested. So if you notice right here on the bottom right, see you've got this little track bar and it says 100%. That's your zoom, okay? So if I take this track bar and I sort of slide it from left to right, you can see I'm zooming in and out. There's a keyboard shortcut as well. If you hold your finger on the control button and then use the mouse wheel, you can sort of scroll in and out. So a little, little, little trick for you, okay? Now, so let me sort of maybe zoom out a little bit further. I know the text might be a little small for you all, but you all have the spreadsheet in front of you. So really want to, oh, let me move that. Really what I wanted to focus on are these values right here. And I've sort of paint, uh, painted them yellow so you can see what's going on. Those are what I would call the only real inputs on the spreadsheet. I've got the initial angle of launch, the initial velocity, and the initial X and Y position. Now, Look right here down on the, the bottom right. That is the pr trajectory of that particle throughout the air. But that trajectory is based on those four numbers. Watch what happens when I take the velocity uh, and I make it 35 meters per second. Everything else changed accordingly. You know what I mean? Not only did my computed parameters, you know, my horizontal, maximum horizontal distance traveled, my um, total uh, flight uh, and what have you, Everything else uh, changed as well according to the, uh, to the plot. Let's go back to my original quantity, so that was 30 and 30. Let's make the angle of launch something crazy, like 80. You can see everything else changed accordingly, right? Now here the particle's only going about, you know, 32 meters out, which actually, let me, let me talk about that, okay? As I change parameters, let's be clear, the motion of the projectile changes as well. Let me go back to the, everything that was original, 30 and 30, okay? We're talking about the motion of a projectile as it goes through the air, right? So let's look at two different, you know, uh, uh, ways that this projectile can move. I'm going to do my best to throw it at the same speed, but I'm going to do one at sort of a low angle, right? And then I'm going to do one at a really high angle. So now, it's still moving in a parabolic fashion, but the parabola is different. The parabola is different because the parameters are different, all right? Same speed, but different angle is going to change the way it looks through the air, right? Sound good? Now, what I can do is I can use this spreadsheet, again, and based on very you know, small inputs, I'm able to change quite a bit. I can use this spreadsheet to perform what I'll call some what-if analysis, okay? So, let me ask a question, all right? Let's go back to... Let me go back to the slide. All right. So let's say I'm a, a basketball player and I got really lofty goals. I want to chuck a basketball 655 meters away. I got I got to be tough to do that. <laughs> but let me let, let's go into this. Okay. So let, let's read this text here on the bottom. Okay. For example, if the launch angle is 45 degrees, maybe a basketball isn't the best analogy. Maybe I ought to be talking about a cannon or something. You know, like something that's going to launch 655 meters away. Let's go to this. If the launch angle was 45 degrees, how fast do we need to launch the projectile to hit a point that's 655 meters away? So in other words, I'm launching at 45 degrees, and what I'm asking is how fast do I need to chuck it so that the distance between here and where it landed was 655 meters. Does, does that make sense? Are you okay with that? All right. So let's, let's go back to our spreadsheet. Now, I'm going to zoom in using control when I'm just using my little mouse wheel. I'm going to zoom in to about right there. Okay, can everybody read that? All right, now let me, let me go back and let me take that color off because I want it to look the way it, uh, it did originally. Okay, so is everybody all right with this and everybody got, kind of got the same thing? Okay, so let's read that statement. Okay, so it said if the launch angle was 45 degrees. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take that launch angle and I'm going to make it 45 degrees. So 45, enter. Okay, so launch angle is 45 degrees. And then the question asks, well, how fast do I need to launch that, that uh, projectile so that it lands 655 meters away? Well, let, let me ask you a question. Right now, as the spreadsheet is listed, 
how far is that projectile traveling horizontally? Say, say it again. 91.7. 91.7, exactly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this cell right here. I'm going to give it a cup. I'm going to highlight that. I want, want that to, to pop. Maybe we'll take that and make it, I don't know, orange or something. I, I, it doesn't matter. I'm just doing that. You don't have to do that. I'm just doing that for my purposes so that everybody can see what's going on. Everybody with me? All right. Now the question's asking how fast does the projectile need to travel? So really, what I need to figure out is what this value needs to be right here. Let me change that. Let me call that blue or something. Okay. So what the problem is asking is what value does that 30 meters per second, right now it's 30, what does it need to be such that the projectile is 625 meters away? Does that sound good? Okay, now that's called what if analysis. You know, if I want these parameters to, 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 to come out in a certain fashion, well, what does the input need to be? Okay, and that, that's, that's what if analysis. It's a very fundamental skill that engineers need to have because they're doing this all the time. You know, uh, if I'm designing a beam, you know, if these are the forces on that beam, how deep does it need to be so that it's safe? You know, this is very common stuff uh, in engineering. So, one way to do this is to just play around with it. So right now, uh, it's 30 meters per second. You tell me, does that value need to be larger or smaller? Larger, so guess one. Just make a guess. 120, okay. So let's just try 120. Too much, right? So let's back it off a little bit. Something else, you tell me what to back it off to. Somebody else. 60. Oh, wrong one. 60. That's too small, right? So somewhere in between 60 and 120, right? So where do we try? What, 70? We'll try 80. Uh-oh, we're, get, we're getting warm, right? Because it's what? What's the 655? It's going to be pretty close to 80, right? So we're on 80. Does it need to go up or down? Up. So maybe what, 81? Ooh, that was too much, right? So we were back at 80. Maybe try 80.5. Ah, uh, still too much, right? Maybe 80.2. Oh, we're getting there. That's a tad too much, right? Tad too much. But does everybody see what's going on? See how we're just sort of changing the value? One of the beauties of Excel is by just changing that input, we can see what the answer is. We can see what the result is. And we can perform this analysis to kind of give us a rough idea. Now look, this is not the exact answer, but does everybody agree that the answer should be around 80.2? Maybe not exactly 80.2, but somewhere around there, right? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite tools uh, in Excel altogether, which is Goal Seek. Okay? Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this back to 30. I'm going to go back to my original quantity. Okay? So that's 30. This came out to be 91.7. Okay, sound good? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I want to talk a little bit about uh, goal seek. Now, I, I imagine that you all are, are trying to, are, are kind of seeing that this is, um, this is taking a while. It ultimately ends up being about 80.16. But isn't this kind of repetitive? I mean, you guess a value, and then you say, all right, um, does that value need to increase or decrease? So you increase it a little bit, and then you say, oh, it needs to go down a little bit. And you just keep, it's, you're just successively guessing over and over again. It's just trial and error. And, and we could sit here and do this till we're blue in the face and get an accurate answer. But it's just going to be the same process over and over and over and over again, right? Well, I propose that we can get Excel to do a lot of this guesswork for us, okay? And we do that through the use of a tool called Goal Seek. So let me show you how this works. All right, so I'm going to go to Excel. Okay, and I'm going to put my cursor out here, just out uh, my, uh, my highlighted cell, just out in the middle of nowhere, because I want this, uh, I want to show how this works. Okay, if you look at your tabs, you know, you got insert, page layout, formulas. I want to go to the data tab. Okay, so the data tab. Okay, you notice you got external data, connection, sorting, uh, and all that. And see right here on the, uh, near the end, it says forecast. Does everybody see that? And then there's that button that says what if analysis. Let's drop down that what if analysis and let's pick goal seek. So what if analysis and let's pick goal seek. Now if you do that, you should have a little, little box that pops up. Okay? Does everybody see something like that? 
Now, I want you to pay attention to, to, to what this is saying, because this is actually, uh, if you think about it, and you actually just read what it says, this is about the simplest procedure that you can do in Excel to, to iterate stuff like this. So let's read what it says. It's saying, set a given cell to a given value by changing another cell. So let's think about what we've been doing this whole time. We have been, tr what, what's our target? What have we been trying to generate right here on this one, the orange one? 655. We've been changing this blue number to get this to be 655. Am I correct? So let's try this. So see that little button right here on the, uh, on the right? That's where you can use the sheet. So I'm going to click that. So I'm going to set that cell right there. And notice how it automatically locks it. That's just the way GoalSeek operates. It automatically locks your reference. So I'm going to set cell C15 to a value of 655, and I'm going to do that by changing the input that's in cell C6. Okay? Does everybody see that? Does everybody understand that? Okay? Now, if you do that right and you hit OK, look what ha watch, watch cell C6. Watch it. You hit OK, and it just goes and does it. Okay? Well, nice, nice sound effect, right? Thank you. I, tr I try sometimes. <laughs> um, let me say this. If your spreadsheet is not doing this, if it didn't do what just happened up here, then more than likely what's happening is that your formulas that you typed in uh, in here have got some errors. Okay? In other words, when you were doing these calculations, you didn't reference the input up here. You just literally typed in the number 30. And, and I mean, that will give you the right answer for a value of 30, but as soon as you change that cell, uh, it won't update. But uh, you hit OK to keep that value, and then there you go. I mean, look at the accuracy. It was going and iterating that down to the 10 or 12th decimal place, okay? See that? It's pretty nifty. You know, once you set up your base equations, stuff like this sort of takes the algebra out of the equation, you know what I mean? You're not having to take some massive algebraic equation and solve for x. You just say, you know that you want the whole equation, the whole pile of junk at the very end to equal zero or whatever. So you just say equals zero, and there you go. All right? Does that make sense? All right, so what I want to do is I, I want you all to just play around with this for a little bit. But I've come up with a few examples. All right, so here's another couple examples. So first off, I, I want you all to at least try one of these two, okay? Now, um, so let, let's, uh, let's play around with this. So let's be clear, all of this, um, all of this, uh, uh, these questions, all still keep x and y uh, equal to zero. These two are equal to zero. So like the first one, if your cannon is stuck at 30 degrees, what's the initial velocity required to hit a target 400 meters away? So if you do that correctly, you should get a value of about 67.313. I want everybody to sort of try that out on their own. Let me see if everybody's getting that, that, uh, that show up. At least the first one. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. I think everybody's sort of working this out. Everybody good? Does anybody have any questions? All right. Now. Um, I will let you all sort of figure out the, what's going on with the, uh, the, uh, the second one, but, but I want to take a little bit of time and talk about the third one, okay? Now, the third one states that if your cannon can only fire uh, at 37 meters per second, what initial angle is required or needed to hit a target that's 125 meters away? Now, what's weird about this is that you can actually get two answers. Now, let, let me be clear, uh, getting two answers for an equation 
shouldn't be an odd prospect in and of itself. I mean, if I have a quadratic equation, how many roots does it have? It has two roots. So it's very possible that you have some equation in engineering and it has two answers. Okay? If your cannon can only fire at 37 meters per second, you can actually have two different inclinations and hit a target that's 125 meters away. And if you use goal seek, it is very possible that you get one of these two answers. And let me explain why. Okay? So I, I, I want to look at this, this last one. So if the cannon can only fire at 37 meters per second, what's the initial angle required? So right here, what I want to do this uh, do is this. So the cannon can only fire at 37 meters per second. So this cell is always going to be 37. So I'm actually going to take this cell and go back to uh, just sort of take the color off that because that's not the one I'm changing. The one that I'm going to change uh, is this one right here. All right. Sound good? Okay, now, let me explain in a little bit more detail about how Goal Seek works. Okay, the way that Goal Seek works is it takes whatever value you had in there to begin with, and it says, was my answer too big or too small? And if so, it adjusts accordingly. So anytime you do Goal Seek, you are at least required to have some initial starting value. If your cell is empty, it's going to take that starting value to equal zero. So watch what happens, okay? I'm going to do this one of two ways, okay? Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, let's make my starting guess really, really small. In this case, you know what? Let's make it zero, okay? So everything comes out to be zero. Now let's do data, what if, goal seek. Let's set my target value to what? What's the distance? Say it again. 125 by changing that. And I go through and do that, and then it gets me that first answer. All right? Does everybody see that? Is everybody able to get that? Okay. So what happened was Excel took that initial starting value, that starting angle of zero, and it said, well, what's my, uh, what's my resulting trajectory? Well, at an angle of zero, um, doesn't have any trajectory at all. So it said, well, that angle needs to go up and up and up and up and up. Sound good? Now, but again, let's be clear, that was based on an initial guess of zero. Okay? Now let's do the flip side. Let's make a really, really large guess. Now I don't want to do 90 because that'll probably give me some division by zero and something like that. So let's try something like 89. Okay, let's try 89. So really, really big angle. So imagine this is my cannon shooting almost like that, really, really high up. Okay. Now let's do the same thing. Let's goal seek it again. So what if goal seek, let's set C15 equal to 125. A quick keyboard shortcut to go from, uh, from cell to cell is you hit the tab button. So like I, I typed in 125 and then I hit tab and you can see my cursor's now down there. All right, so I'm going to do that by changing cell C5 and hit OK. So does everybody see how there's two potential answers? Everybody see that? OK. Let's say that you are doing this problem and you go, well, I need, I need a little more control over which answer Excel gives me. Okay. In order to enforce that control a little bit more strongly, um, Goal Seek is not really the, uh, the, the, the best tool. I mean, I like Goal Seek because it's simple. But I think that's also one of its uh, faults, is that it's too simple. With more complex problems and more complex goals, Goal Seek will only get you so far. Okay? In other words, and a very good example is a quadratic equation. I mean, let's say you have a quadratic equation and you know one of the roots is going to be positive and you know one of the roots is going to be negative. Okay? What if you wanted goal or Excel to do all the iteration but you only wanted it to give you the positive answer? Then you have to subject that uh, analysis to some constraints. Like, solve this equation but whatever solution you pick, the answer better be positive. Make sense? Okay? Goal seek won't do that, but solver will. Okay? Solver is a tool that's in Excel that will do exactly what goal seek does, but it will do it with a lot more options and a lot more uh, availability.
Now, I'm curious. I want everybody to open their data tab, and I want to see something. Um, do you have solvers showing up on the very right of the data tab? No, you probably don't, right? Okay. Solver is one of those things you have to go in and add. So I'm going to show you how you do that. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to File up here on the top where it says File. And then on the bottom, you're going to hit Options. Okay. You hit Options, and you should have a little dialog box pops up, uh, something like this, right? Everybody see that? Okay, go uh, here on the left where it says Add-ins. Okay. Everybody see that? Okay, and then down here on the bottom where it says manage your Excel add-ins, hit go. Okay, and you hit go and there's a number of add-ins that are available. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to click the first one and the last one. Okay, and I'll explain what those are. The last one's the one we're going to use today, that's solver. The, the first one uh, has a number of statistical uh, uh, functions that we're going to use later, so we'll go ahead and add that now. The two middle ones, um, the top one is for if you want to do programming uh, with, uh, with Excel. And then uh, the last, that Euro currency is just some financial analysis stuff for, for Euros uh, and what have you. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and hit OK. If you hit OK, you might have something pop up that says it needs to install some stuff. It might take a couple minutes. Um, by, if you went and did that, you might have something to say Microsoft Office Professional Plus uh, is installing. It might take a little bit. Is everybody able to, to get there? So yours installing, yours installing. Okay. All right. If you've done that correctly, if you look on the data tab, you should now see some stuff over here on the right, and you should see Solver. Does everybody see that? Okay. All right. Bless you. All right. So you should have this pop up. So. While everybody is sort of doing their, uh, doing their thing uh, with, with Solver, um, let me sort of explain how, how Solver is going to work. So Solver is a lot like Goalseek. You just have additional uh, options. And we call those particular options constraints. Now, what I mean by a constraint uh, is this. So, for instance, let's go to that last example. So that last example said, if your cannon can only fire at 37 meters per second, what initial angle is needed to hit a target that's 125 meters away? We got two answers. Well, I can use solver for this as well, but I want to say, you know what? In order to ensure that I'm only get, getting one of those angles, I'm going to use solver, but I'm going to have it solve that equation such that the answer that I get is the one that's less than 45 degrees. Okay? So by, doing that, by entering that constraint, I'm going to try and force Excel that no matter what, I want that answer. Okay? I'm going to test it by using a really big angle. Okay? So we'll, we'll try that out. All right, sound good? All right. So opening up Excel, actually let me close this and let me, let me go back here and make this a really big angle. Let's go back to that 89 value. Okay. So let's go to Solver. Now, if you look here on the top, everything on the top should be very similar to what was in goal seek. We're going to set our objective to a given value by changing some variable cells. So I'm going to make that the same. I'm going to do the same thing I, I did before. I'm going to set the objective. In this case, the objective is this uh, C15, the X max. I'm going to set the objective. So we'll click the little button to, to get out of that, you know, C15 and click that to go away to a value of, now what's our target again? 125. And we're going to do that by changing the quantities that are in cells C5. So by changing C5. All right. Has everybody got this so far? Everybody good? Okay. But now there's a whole bunch of other stuff. There's a whole bunch of other stuff there at the bottom. So we're going to subject that to the following constraints. And I'm going to add a constraint. What constraint do you think I'm going to add? Well, what is the problem state our constraint's going to be? The, the angle is less than 45 degrees. Specifically, what's going on in cell C5? I want cell C5 to be less than or equal to 45 degrees. Sound good? So I'm going to hit add a constraint. Okay. 
Your, the 8.30 alarm to wake up? Goodness. All right. So if you hit add a constraint, you should have a box that pops up, looks something like this. Now it says cell reference, and it has uh, uh, an inequality term, and then the constraint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say cell reference C5. And you could say I want it to be less than or equal to a given quantity. I want it to be equal. I want it to be an integer, you know, or what have you. I'm just going to say that it must be less than or equal to a given value. Now what I can do is I could say that this cell must be less than or equal to some cell over here, but instead I'm just going to literally go in and say that must be less than or equal to 45. Everybody okay with that? So hit OK. Now let's just see what happens. Boom. So now it automatically picked the one that we want. Make sure that you hit OK to actually keep your solution. And then there you go. Okay, now, let me show you something real quick because this is in relevance to your homework. I want to show you what I want you to do for your homework. I'm not going to go into the actual problem because I want you to figure that out on the homework. But let's say that this is your answer. So watch what I want you to do. I want you to go highlight all of that and copy it. You can hit Control C and then go over here to your answer. Click your cursor in and Control V. So when you turn it in, you're just going to put that answer here. Now that's not the answer. I'm going to let you all figure out what the answer is, but that's how I want you to, to um, submit that, that problem. Does that sound reasonable? Everybody okay with this? Does anybody have any questions so far? Because I got a, a solver example that we're going to do that's a little more involved, but I think really helps uh, solver shine, and I think it's also really easy to understand. Everybody good? Okay, all right. So let's play around with this for a little bit. So um, let me I'm actually going to close the in-class exercise because we're going to do uh, another uh, exercise using Solver sort of right now. So I'm going to close this. I'm not going to save changes. So. And, and I want to talk about this. No, no, because you're, you're going to want, that's a good question. I wouldn't save your changes to what we've been doing today because ultimately the uh, sheet that you enter needs to match what's on the exercise. So I wouldn't save the changes. All right. Sound good? All right. Okay, now, here's uh, an example with Solver that's a little more intricate. Okay. Now, all right. Um, Look at this. Let's everybody look up here. So, so let's say that you are the production manager for a company that makes three different products. Okay? All right. We can look at that after. It's, it's all right. All right. Let's say that you are the production manager for a company that makes three different products. Okay? Now, for every product that you make, you earn some profit, right? If I make some widget and I sell it to somebody, I'm going to make some money off of it. Hopefully. That's sort of the... Fundamentals of economics, right? Now, let's say I make three different products, a product A, a product B, and a product C. Now, for each product, I make a different profit. So let's say for product A, I make 13 bucks. And for product B, I make 18 bucks. And for product C, I make 22 bucks. Now, I don't think it takes a, a, a Nobel Prize in economics to recognize that I want to sell as much product C as possible, right? Uh, it's just simple, right? I make as much money on, uh, or make more money on product C than I do all the others. So I want to sell as much product C as possible. So if the question was, which one do I need to sell the most of, and that's it, we, we wouldn't need Solver at all. We wouldn't need Excel at all. That's just common sense, you know. Make as much money as you can. Now, now let's add some real world constraints to it. Okay. So, you know, I'm, 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 I got a company. I'm selling these products. Okay. I've got contracts out. I've got other investors, other individuals that need some of these products. I mean, if you're selling a product, hopefully you're selling it because somebody needs it. Okay? So let's say I add some constraints to this production. Okay? So number one, no matter what, I've got to produce 300 units a day. Okay? Now, I'm not saying I need 300 units of product C or 300 units of product B, but I could have 100 apiece. I could have 50 of A and 100 of, of B and 150 of C, you know, just that constraint by itself, I need to sell 300 units. Sound good? Now, um, 
I have an ex I have a couple existing orders, so no matter what, I got to have at least 50 units of product A and at least uh, 40 units of product B. I got clients out there that that uh, you know are using my products. I got to sell at least this many products per day uh, to meet the demands of clients that I've already got. Now I'd love to sell as much uh, uh, product C as I can. But product C, because I make a lot of money on it, it's also kind of expensive to produce. So I can only produce 40 units per day of product C. So my question is, what should my production schedule sh uh, be so that I get the most money? Okay. In other words, you know, as I, I, I want to sell some, some of this, some of this, and some of this, but how much do I need to sell in order to make the most money? Okay. That's, I, I got a business. I'm selling this stuff. I want to make money. Okay. Does everybody kind of get the idea? All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the following table. So I want everybody to open Excel because uh, I want us to work on setting up this table together. Okay, so I'm going to open up a, a blank, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a blank spreadsheet. Okay, so here's my blank spreadsheet. Now, one of the things I want to be clear about um, this spreadsheet is going to do a lot of computations for us. In other words, we're not going to be just typing in values. Okay, we're just going to, um, uh, the only thing we're really going to be typing in, I guess, is our labels and some of our inputs. I want Excel to do as much calculations uh, as possible. So I look here and I got four uh, headers. I got products. Okay, I've got units. Now I'm using the tab button to go from cell to cell if I'm going from left to right. So I got profit per unit and I got <coughs> profit. Now one of the things you might notice right here is notice how in that, that third cell, that D2, see how I typed profit per unit and that actual label is a little big? In other words, see how profit is sort of overlapping it a little bit? Well, I don't want that to happen because I want to actually read what I'm writing. So there's a couple ways of going about that. One way of going about that is to physically, all right, see, see right here when I put my mouse over D and see how the, the cell turns green? So now if I click that, it would be selecting the entire column. So like right here, I've got a given row selected. Now I'm selecting the entire column. Okay, if I want to make this column a little wider, see how I hover right over there and see how you get that sort of plus sign with the arrows? Everybody see that? I can literally make it wider, okay? And sometimes that's reasonable if you've got a really large label and you want to read what you're writing, okay? Now, if you want Excel to automatically fit that label, you go over here, and instead of dragging like this, you literally just double click. All right, does everybody see that? You can literally, like, if you have your column like that, just double click. And bam, it'll, it'll hug and it'll fit all of the, the content that's in those cells. Sound good? It's a quick way of getting your sheet to be, or your table to be readable. Now, the third way of doing that is you can highlight any columns that you're interested in. I'm going to highlight all of these. So I'm clicking where it says B and I'm just clicking and holding and dragging. So I got B, C, D, and E. You can do this with one column or 80 columns. It doesn't matter. And I'm just going to right click and go format column width and I can actually type in a column width. In this case I'll do something like 12. And now all the columns are a little wider and they're all the same width. Does everybody see that? Okay. All right. So that's just you know one way of, uh, of going about this. Okay. Now, how many products do I have? Three, right? So I'm going to hit uh, uh, under cell B, I've got product A, whoop, didn't have my shift button there, A, B, C, okay? Now, over here on the D column, these are the profits per unit, and it was $13 and what? You tell me. 13 and what? There we go, 13, 18, and 22. Now, I'm lazy. One way that you can uh, get this to look like money is to highlight those cells and literally click that dollar sign under number, and there you go. Everybody see that? Okay, now, 
I'm going to make up some numbers just to get started. Okay, now these numbers are in no way, shape, or form going to match the constraints that I'm, I'm placing on the problem. I just want some values in there to, to get started. So let's just say, uh, I don't know, 25 units a piece. So 25, enter, 25, enter, 25, enter. Everything else that's in my table, I want it to compute, okay? So first off, let's, let's look down here, okay? The total number of units. If I want the total number of units here, how could I do that? There's a couple ways of doing that. I could do sum, or I could say equals this plus this plus this, right? And then, bam. So now, here the, the important part, again, you do not type in the number 75. I know that the total is 75, but the point is, if I go up here and I change this to 30, I want the total to update. Okay? Everybody with me on that? All right. Now, let's look at each item. Okay? Now, what is my profit per unit on product A? $13. Okay, now how many, according to the table that's there right now, how many units of product A have I sold? 20, 25, right? So, so if, if I make $13 on each product A, and I've sold 25 of them, how much profit have I made on that product? How do I figure that out? There you go. There you go. Now the big thing is do not literally type in the number 25 times the number 13. Do equals C3 times D3. Okay, so that'd be $325, right? Now, I'm lazy, so I don't want to type that formula in over and over again. There's two ways of, of repeating that. I can copy and paste, or I can use, remember my little fill handle? Remember that little handle right there? The little, little black plus sign right there? You can drag, or you can Double click, okay? Now double clicking will we'll fill this cell in right here, but I want to do something a little different uh, right there. Has everybody got the 325, the 450, and the 550? Everybody got that? So I want to know the total profit all in all. I can do equals that plus that plus that. So based on that, uh, you know, production schedule, 25 units a piece, I'm making about $1,325. I think I can do better, okay? I'd like to make more money. All right, before I make more money, uh, go into that, I want to format this table up a little bit. So one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to highlight all of these. I'm going to center them up, okay? So I'll center them up. Okay, has everybody got that? And then let's just keep it simple. Let's take the top row and the bottom row. Let's make them bold. So you can do control B or you can hit that little bold button up here. Either one. <coughs> and then the last thing I'll do is I will highlight this. And maybe put a little border under that, like right there, right next to the underline symbol. And then another one right there. Zach, it gives me a little, little bit of a better visual cue as to, to what's going on. Everybody okay with this? All right. Now, this is where Solver really comes into shine. So I'm going to start playing around with that production schedule, that stuff that's in C3 to C5. But before we start opening up Solver, let me ask a question. What do you think my goal is? Uh, I mean, what's my goal overall in this whole exercise? I want to do what? I want to make money, and I want to maximize my profit. So in other words, I want this cell right here to be as big as it can, right? The bigger that cell, the more money for Greg, and Greg likes money, all right? Everybody okay with that? All right, so let's go to Solver. So Data Solver. Okay, now, first off, the objective, okay? I'm not setting the objective to a given value. First off, my objective is whatever is in cell, let's see, let's click that, and it's cell E6, right? Now, instead of setting that to a given value, or a, a value of whatever, 
I'm going to set it to maximum, right? So I've got maximum, minimum, and value of. I want that instead of maximum, minimum. I want it to be a maximum, okay? So I want to maximize that. Now, I'm going to change not one cell. I'm going to change a bunch of cells. So I'm going to click this little range, and instead of changing like just cell three, I'm going to highlight those three. Like those are the ones that I'm changing. I'm trying to figure out what my production schedule can be to maximize that profit. Make sense? All right, so we'll do that. Now, if all I did was hit OK right now, I guarantee you what would happen is uh, it would get mad at me because it would take uh, uh, cell number, uh, the one for product C, and it would just start increasing it over and over and over and over again, and it would say it's infinity, and, and well, I, I would be okay with that having infinity dollars, but, but, um, <laughs> but that really isn't very realistic according to the problem. So let's go into the constraints and let's see if we can define some constraints to get uh, some values that make sense. Okay, so what's one of the first constraints we're going to have? What's the first one? 300 products total. Now, how are we going to, first off, okay, so let's add a constraint. So, let's add a constraint. So, so first off, you said 300 products total. So, I propose that something needs to equal 300, okay? What needs to equal 300? What's that? Well, C3 through 5, the sum of that, but... There we go. C6 needs to be 300. That's what that cell was for. So I propose that cell reference C6, that, that right there, that needs to be 300. Okay? Because that's what that is. That cell is computing the total number of items sold. That's got to be 300. Make sense? Okay. So we'll hit OK on that. So there's one constraint. All right? Now let's look at the second one. What's the next constraint? What, what does it say? Okay, but, okay, no, okay, so we're talking about cell C3 and 50 units, but let's read, what does, what does it actually say? Let's read it out. Okay, so you need 50 units uh, of product, uh, 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 that unit per day. So think about the context. I'm selling this stuff to, uh, uh, to some uh, manufacturer who buys product A, and I've got this client, and they need at least 50 units per day. So what am I going to have? Less than or equal? Equal, will you tell me? Greater than or equal to, because I'm okay with selling more than 50 units per day, but I have to have at least 50 units per day. So I propose that my constraint is that cell C3 has got to be greater than or equal to 50. Does that make sense? All right. What's what's all right? If that's my 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 uh, second constraint, what's my third one going to be? If C three's got to be greater than or equal to fifty, what's the next one? Wh okay, greater than or equal to forty. Which cell? C four. Explosive, right? So C four's got to be greater than or equal to forty. So let's add C four greater than or equal. To 40. All right. Now, my last constraint. What's my last one? Because of product demand, I, or because of material supply and limited availability, I can't produce any more than 40 units of product C. Don't get me wrong. I'd like to produce as much as I can. But I can't produce any more uh, than 40. So what do I do for cell C5? Less than or equal to 40. All right. So let's add our final constraint. Let's say that C5 has got to be less than or equal to 40. Everybody got that? So if you've done that right, your constraints should look something like here on the right. Now what happens is I hit solve, bam, and hit OK. So now what Excel has done is it's figured out what permutation of products do I need to sell so that Greg makes the most money? And I like that because Greg likes to make money. All right. But think now. Now let's let's also let's sort of keep in the back of our head. Let's analyze this solution. Let's also see if it passes what we engineers call the smell test. In other words, does it make sense? You know, we we set up this, this this Excel sheet and we hit this button and it came up with some numbers. Do the numbers make sense? Okay. Well, let's think about this. 
Let's start off by talking about product C. All right, now product C was very obviously my most profitable product, right? And that, that was the one that was making me the most money. Now, I like money, so I want to sell as much product C that I can. So what was my constraint on product C? The constraint said that because of limited availability, I can only produce 40 per day. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to produce 40 per day because I want money. So, so right there, the fact that the solution generated 40 units for product C, that should make sense, right? It should make sense because it's what we're after, right? We're, we're after that. Now, the remaining two items are products A and product B, okay? Now, out of product A and product B, which one is more profitable? B. B. So between those two, I want to sell more B than I do A. And the solution yielded that I've got 50 units of A and 210 units of B. So 50 units of A. Am I meeting the demands of that client who's got my product A line? Yeah. And as for product B, well, I'm meeting the 40. And since that was my next profitable item, let's just load it down. Sell as much product B as I can. And in the end, how many products per day am I selling? 300. So that is the most amount of money that I can make. And if you don't believe that, do this, you know. Take this and make that 49, make that 211. You know, you might get a larger value, but you're also violating your constraints. You see what I mean? Because you're not meeting the constraints of, of product, uh, product A. There is no permutation none whatsoever that will generate a larger profit, okay? Because this problem was very, what I would say, well-defined, I mean, this is a very well-defined problem, there's one answer, okay? This is a very powerful tool uh, for, for, for engineering analysis. And I mean, there's a number of examples that you'll use uh, later. Um, like, this is, I, I don't mean to show you this to, uh, to intimidate you, this is just stuff that you can do later on in your, uh, in your engineering uh, curriculum. So, like this is just uh, to give you an idea, this is something that you can do either in engineering economics or in, uh, in hydraulics. This is a, a project looking at a, a pump storage project. So the idea is based on giving uh, different pipe diameters, different uh, pumps and different um, delivery of flow. The idea is what pump and what uh, flow rate will ultimately generate the most uh, profit for your hydroelectric uh, power plant uh, and what have you. So you can go through and set up these massive calculations. I know it looks daunting, uh, and it's, it's a you know, upper level class project, so there's a lot of work to it. But ultimately, you can go back and calculate you know, how much money uh, you're going to make in the end. And this stuff can get simple or it can get uh, really complicated. But that's one of the beauties of uh, using tools like Solver is once you've set up the problem, let Excel do all the hard work. You, you see what I mean? I mean, that, that's sort of what it's for. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think it's important for you all to be able to do the necessary computations to negotiate not only your engineering degree, but your engineering career. But that being said, I don't really see much value in doing the same calculation over and over and over and over and over, you know, thousands of times if you can make this do it for you, okay? Make sense? All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, let me put it like this. That's a good question. So why didn't Excel tell me that? Because I haven't actually put anywhere in my sheet some warning that says that that's no good. You're, you're at, I'll, I'll show you something uh, real quick. Um, and we are going to talk about this later. Okay? You can use Excel to do some very basic programming. Okay? So um, what I could have over here on the side is I'll make up a, a, a formula and kind of show you something. One of the formulas that you can use, like you know how we've used like uh, cosine and we've used sine and something like that and, and, and radians and all that. One of the formulas that you can use is if. Okay, you can actually do if then statements. So I could have something like if this value is less than or equal to 50, then that is you know no good. Otherwise, you know, okay. And then, so right now it's saying that that's no good, but if I go through and change that to, you know, 60, oh, just fine, okay? You can actually set your sheet to give you those visual warnings. Let me say this. If I put 
But let me let me also answer that in another fashion. If I put actually, you know, what what was that? 49. If I put 49 there, I mean, there's nothing preventing the sheet from actually doing the computations. But if I go through and run solver again, it won't think that's a valid solution, and it'll change it because it violates one of the constraints. Does that make sense? Sol solver will generate a solution based on those constraints. You can take that solution do whatever you want with it, uh, which is why later on, like, a lot of the sheets that I do for things like concrete design and steel design, I have a bunch of these little if-then statements so that if I start changing values, it tells me, whoa, that's no good, you know. So, but that's, that stuff we'll, we'll handle uh, later on after the exam. That's a good question, though. Did that, did that answer your question? Anybody else? This is good stuff. There we go. Anybody else? One, uh, one point I will mention, it, this is iteration, so because of that, Technically, it's approximate. Like, you look at this, and it, it didn't say 210. It said 210.00000006. It, what it's doing is it's successively guessing. And Excel has certain tolerances for what it considers to be an accurate answer. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, 210.00000000, whatever. That's essentially 210. Okay? Sound good? Now, I could have placed additional constraints on the problem and actually forced the answer to be in integers, and then it probably would have generated the, you know, 210, but for what we're doing in here, it's enough for government work. All right. Any questions? This is good stuff. Everybody good? All right. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to shut up a little bit and let you all finalize your homework for uh, if you look, problem three said, do in-class exercise two, but oh, by the way, there's this little solver thing at the end. So hopefully after today, you can knock out that solver request. If you've got in-class exercise two done, you should be able to fi uh, finish that in about 30 seconds. So uh, hopefully that that's the, uh, works out well, and I'm here. So if you've got any questions, you know, take advantage. All right, that's all we got.